Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the next next episode of The Era, where we really go deep on the, the fundamental hypothesis that your experience that you're giving to your employees is fundamentally tied to the business success of your organization. And if you want to drive better business outcomes, rather than trying to focus on all the outcomes and the results, focus first on that experience that your employees are having with you as a brand in their day-to-day -day work. We are so excited to continue the conversation around employee experience with Ashik Ahmed, who is the CEO and CTO and co-founder of Deputy. Deputy is a, a global and leading workforce management solution. They're also um, a Bamboo customer and one of our most valued partners. So I'm excited that we get to make this connection here on the on the podcast. But you think about Deputy and they're serving over 40,000 customers, I believe, Ashik, and you'll have to tell me if I, if I get that wrong and correct me. Their headquarters is in beautiful Sydney, Australia. And you, we're going to get into the background, but if you look at the why behind this, it was really, Ashik built, built this platform with his co-founder, um, ultimately from necessity as, as they were running a small business. And, um, and this necessity ultimately bloomed into what is one of the, the fastest growing and leading um, HR tech and workforce management solutions on the, on the planet. And the thing that I love about um, Ashik's perspective that I think we'll get into is he is a technologist, a trained technologist who also likes people. Yes, they exist. And, um, and with his team, he's built an award-winning culture and is power, powering wonderful employee experiences all over the world. So, Ashik, thank you for being here and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for having me, Brad. You just painted me as a unicorn, a technologist who loves people. <laughs> but, I love that. But, uh, <laughs> I, hey, it's important to know that these exist out on out in the world. Yeah, look, I mean, a, uh, well, it's, it's not being a technologist who loves people. I, I think, like, you know, I see with so many of our customers, and I think you see it as well. Quite a lot of the time, people are just good at their craft, and that craft has made them an entrepreneur or a business owner, and then they realize oh my God, I can't do everything myself. I got to get people. Okay, I have to replicate myself. And you can't do that unless you love people. So that's the way that you de you discovered that. So let's actually start there on, you know, on what your journey's been like, you know, that your, you know, your experiences that led up to founding Deputy and then some of those, those inflection moments that you've had in your own leadership journey. So let's like, why Deputy? How did this whole thing happen and kind of, you know, was it all planned? There was a vision from the beginning or was this a, a, a progressive disclosure um, situation? Uh, um, well, I like to believe, and this is something that Jeff Bezos always says, that you don't choose your passion. Your passion chooses you. Okay, so, and I think that's kind of the story. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a migrant. Uh, um, I was born in a country called Bangladesh. I came to Australia at the age of... Uh, 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 16, I, I did not know anything about entrepreneurship or other things. I don't think in my mother tongue, there's actually a dry, direct translation of the word entrepreneur. Okay. So, <laughs> so that wasn't there. And even until I came to Australia, I don't think I even saw, saw a computer, Brad. So I, I, I was definitely not born destined or anything like that. I think like, you know, uh, 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 for doing what I'm doing, but what as, you know, I mean, in, as as it happened, I uh, I was an hourly paid shift worker myself. Uh, when I came to Australia as a migrant into um, in the Western world, I was actually the first one to find a job uh, in my whole family as a 16 year old um, as an as a shift worker. I had no idea still that I would be the um, uh, 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 I'll be finding a platform then or knew anything about SaaS or tech for that matter. I then started working uh, for my co-founder um, uh, as an employee where he was having a lot of challenges in scaling his small business. And he was in probably one of the toughest business condition anyone can be in, which is actually in the world of aviation, okay? and especially aviation ground handling. It's a, it's, I like, I talk about any business. This is probably the most complex business. It's, uh, it's 24 hours. It's highly compliant, okay? I mean, you don't get to sleep anything, okay? I mean, every, everyone is to be trained and qualified, fatigue management, you name it. Scheduling was the biggest challenge it can be um, in there. And, and finally, it had to be, it was a very unionized. It's a complex environment. 
as a unionized environment where he was operating and he was doing everything manually. Like I, uh, I used to, uh, I, I, I saw this in my eyes, okay? If somebody called in sick, the world will just turn upside down. My co-founder, Steve Shelley, would only have, or any of his managers would only have three options when somebody calls in sick back then. You, if it's a position you can let go unfulfilled, okay? Like, you know, hey, you've got, if you walked into any airport, there's about three or four checking desks where they're checking you in. One of them has called in sick. Okay, the other two will do the job. All right, it's extra work for them. If it's a role that you can't let go, say some, the, the, uh, the person who pushes the airplane back, the pushback tractor driver, that's a very highly skilled role, okay? If you ever had to reverse a trailer, you would know what I mean, okay, in terms of how hard that job is. And especially we are pushing back something that is about uh, 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 200 ton and, you know, um, with a lot of, uh, lot of uh, souls on board. Uh, so if it's not that, then what do you do? Okay, you either stop doing what you are doing and jump in to do that if you're skilled to do that. Um, and sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to sacrifice on um, your family life. Um, the third option, which ended up being the most option he did, back then they would pull out their Nokia 8820D, if anybody remembers what that phone was back then, <laughs> and go through everybody in the address group calling different people to see if someone's going to come in and pick up that shift. And you know what? Usually you would find that person who is the lifesaver, the rock star, who never says no because they feel bad saying no. They come in and do that shift, okay? But one week they end up working 100 hours, has an injury at work, and then everything falls apart. True story. Okay? <laughs> I, as I was as working for Steve, that's one of the first problems I actually uh, 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 solved for him in terms of how you're able to, if somebody calls in sick, just tap on person shift and go find a replacement, find who is qualified, find who's not going to be fatigued, find who is actually not doing another double shift over there and be able to cover that. Uh, that's just one of 100 different things we we're solving. And, and like the result of it was um, it took... Uh, that business to grow from two people to 200 people, about 10 years it took. When I joined and put a whole lot of automation into the business, um, we were able to scale from 200 people to 1,400 people in a space of three years, okay? Whilst like in really simplifying all the admin challenges and everything, uh, everything that came. Um, and I know so many people found employment in an industry that didn't have employment. Everyone were able to grow, grow their wealth. Um, I mean, I like you know the the validation I got out of doing what I was doing was 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 tremendous. I actually was leaving the business after achieving what I could achieve for that business, and and Steve tapped me on the shoulder and was like, "Hey, all my other friends who also have business, they're running one hairdresser, one pub, or one bar, and they're still struggling with that one." And they go like, "How have you built so much wealth?" And and like you know, I I tell well. I think like, you know, they didn't necessarily have someone like you. And I'm talking, this is, by the way, 2002, 2003. This is well before the world of SaaS, okay? And other things in there. And, and uh, uh, it's like, you know, uh, it's like, you know, why don't we do something where the solution we had, you had built for me, we, uh, we have it available for them. Uh, that solution was almost a year P for a aviation industry a business. But uh, we talked about, hey, I mean, for all the things it did, the one thing it did do is really empower people, Okay be it the employees or the managers or the business owner for that matter. It was almost the second in charge to the business owner, Steve. Um, and we, I'm like, you know what? Validation in life comes from enriching other people's life. I was able to enrich his life and everybody in that business. What if we could do that for everybody else, okay? And yeah, we joined and about 14 years ago. Actually, in two weeks time, it will be our 14th birthday. Um, and, wow! Congratulations! Uh, and yeah, so you guys are uh, you guys are another walking example of a 14 year overnight success story. <laughs> That's right, right. Uh, um, but no, there's a long way to go. Long, long way to go. Okay, there's two billion shift workers. Uh, small businesses uh, have an average life expectancy of three to five years. Many, very few businesses actually become get to become the success that. Uh, Steve was himself in his past business. Um, so, uh, you know, our mission in life is to simplify shift work and make it really, really easy for the employer of shift workers and the shift workers in terms of how easily can they get their shifts and be scheduled for the shift. 
tracking their time and ensuring they're paid correctly for it. We're not the HR software. That's where you are, Brad. And, you know, we are, as, as you said, we are Bamboo HR customer ourselves for last uh, um, um, seven years. Uh, I use Bamboo HR every single day. And that's why our partnership works, because you are the best at what you do. We are the best and want to be the best at what we do. And this is the partnership that makes our customers uh, thrive as well. Thank you for the kind words, but also just thank you for walking us through that um, your journey. Because I'm just always inspired by the way business begins and the thought and the idea, and then ultimately what becomes the harnessed mission and values of a company. So let's talk a little bit about like guiding principles as as you think about as you would, as you talk inside a deputy but also advise many other businesses what are the guiding principles that come to culture and then how does that interact with mission vision values how do you get this all to work to, together so look i mean there's two ways of looking at this um, i mean there are actually two kind of companies in the world okay there are companies who thinks company outward and there are companies who think customer inward. Neither is right or wrong. It's totally up to the, the CEO or the board or the founder or the entrepreneur kind of to decide who you want to be. Okay? Do you want to think company uh, uh, outward or customer inward in here? Having said that, companies, and I tell this all the time, Companies are people-powered machines. Okay? No matter which company you look at, okay, everything changes. Everything changes all the time. Technology changes, macro environment changes. Talk about macro environments where in one at the moment. <laughs> okay? But the thing that is constant over here is the people you have. I mean, the people will change as well, but you have your people in there. And uh, and the number one reason, and if you even if you look at the journey of a small business over here, you, know, you start... Um, you know, a founder starts the business, they hire, uh, um, you know, their first employee up to their 10 employees, and then they realize, oh my God, I can't just be doing what I'm doing. I need to get a manager involved. Then they get a manager hired. Probably it's a promotion of the first employees they had hired that becomes a manager. Okay. And then those managers hire other managers in there. Okay. And soon enough, you've got the Dunbar's number and thing and all sorts of like, I mean, we can spend a whole day about talking about all the HR philosophies and practice and things and stuff like that in, 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 in there. But at the end of the day, I mean, uh, you know, mission, vision, values, uh, OKRs, you name it, all these things exist. They're just tactics and framework. But what do you have to understand? What do you have to understand? And I keep saying this, is that companies are people-powered machines. Okay, companies are, are, are people-powered machines and you... Um, and, you know, you ask everybody, uh, you know, everybody wants to have more revenue. Everybody has to, wants to uh, grow more. Where does the revenue come from? Revenue comes from your customers. Okay. And especially if you're in the world of retail or hospitality uh, or healthcare, you know, sectors that we are very big in along with, uh, along with Bamboo, uh, HR as well. Like, you know, I mean, most of the money over actually comes from repeat customers. Okay, it's not about just a one-time customer; it's the repeat customer. And so, what I actually tell the, uh, tell most uh, most of our customers as well, um, or people, folks I talk to, is that for somebody to be a repeat customer, three things have to go right. Number one, your product has to be great. Number two, the environment. Okay, be it a restaurant or retail shop, the environment. And the third thing is the people experience. The staff they were engaging with, that has to be great, okay? Matter of fact, if any of them are bad, a customer will not think about coming back twice, <laughs> okay? They will question that, do I want to go back to that restaurant with my friend? Do I want to go back to that place to buy something again? Okay, or oh, somebody was rude to me, um, or, or so forth. So what I actually keep telling uh, our customers, actually, is that the number one driver for your customer engagement is actually your people engagement, if your people are not engaged, your customer are not going to engage. Now you can choose whatever framework that you need to use to drive that engagement higher. Be it the mission, vision, values, okay, be it OKRs, okay. It's, it's totally, I mean, I don't think there's a silver bullet that someone can apply that will just 
um, you know, solve everyone's problem and different companies in different journey, depending on their nature, needs to apply different things in there. But if you don't take care of the people, if you don't have this in your mind that I need to keep my people engaged, you're not going to get your customer engaged, you're not going to have the revenue, you're, then you're probably going to die. And Ashik, where do people get this wrong? Because what you're saying is like, that just sounds like just big old giant truth bombs, right? Like, yes, of course, yes. And and I don't think anyone's going to argue with you. So where do people get it wrong? I think people get it wrong because, and I actually uh, wrote this as a LinkedIn post a couple of weeks ago, is that people get it wrong because they, they're lost in their mind. Why did they start the business in the first place, number one? And number two, they also lost it. Why did they give a job to someone um, in the first place? And I, I mean, I was actually reflecting on this myself, Brad, the, a couple of days ago. Um, when I arrived in Australia many, many years ago, um, you know, I mean, I was the first person to get a job um, in my family. That job wasn't just a job for me. It was a, it was a lifeline. It was hope. It was dream. And um, many people actually don't pay attention to what it means to actually have a job in there and how to give purpose to the people you have hired. If you can do that, okay, if you can do that, and as I said, mission, vision, values, or cares, these are all frameworks over here. But if you don't appreciate, if you don't have that respect in your heart about what it means to give somebody a job, and if the person who is getting the job, they don't have that respect in their heart about why they got that job, none of these frameworks is going to do anything at all for you. Okay? So be grounded. Be humble. Be grounded. Be humbled as a leader about who you are and be authentic. Then everyone will see it. Everyone will see it. And if you just have that in you, everything else will work, okay? But trying to think like, oh, I'm just going to pick this up from this book and go and apply that. Nothing, none, none of these things. And whatever you do, even if it seems like it's working, it's just going to be a, a Band-Aid, okay? And truth about Band-Aid, Band-Aids fall off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and so it sounds like, I mean, Ashik, those are some hard-won lessons that you just taught. And... And um, and I think about that, like, the, I mean, I felt just the power and the the emotion behind, hey, when I got that first job when I was 16 in Australia, what it meant to you and your family, like the fact that, the you know, a sh uh, you know, shift work and working in an, in an hourly job to where that was the lifeline that you needed and your family needed at an important time and having respect for that, no matter the role, I think the, the humility, the authenticity that we need to have as business owners, leaders, and um, and managers, as we think about that people experience that they're having, um, I, I you know, like we all get caught up in trying to, I, I, I talk about it versus playbooks versus toolkits. A lot of times we try to say, well, look, I talked to a chic deputy. This is what he's doing. Let's do the same thing. That's like copying a playbook. Um, but I, I, I like the approach of a toolkit more to where it's like in my toolbox, I have lots of things that I've learned or read, or I've, I, I've, I picked up from, you know, others who are in similar situations and I can choose to take that tool out and use it, but it's used in context of my business or my situation. And, and I think that's what you're talking about. Don't get caught up in the frameworks, get caught, use tools but the tools have to be used to drive authenticity and humility and appreciation for who's there helping you. Um, that's a really powerful message to leaders. No, absolutely. Look, I mean, all the use of toolkits and frameworks uh, in here uh, or, or like, you know, copying someone. Um, I mean, I, I, I learned this as a, a bit of religious wisdom, actually, about how to make a bad decision. Okay. Nobody knows what's a good decision, okay? <laughs> Only time will tell whether, whether you made a good decision or not. But a bad decision actually has one, sorry, one of these three traits, maybe all of them. Number one is conformity, okay? You just keep doing what you're doing and don't change. Number two, okay, is monkey see, monkey do. Oh, that's what that company was doing? We'll just do that as well, okay? Um, and number three is doing... Uh, we see a lot of that right oh, now. Oh, man, everybody's doing a lot of that. And the number three is actually 
you know, making a decision where you're actually, you know, making the decision to please somebody. Or if I did this, the CEO would be happy. If I did this, the CPO would be happy or something like that. So, I mean, I would really like, you know, ask people who are struggling with when it comes to uh, keeping your people engaged or looking ways to engage your people is to dig deep and ask why, 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 okay? Why me? Why us? Why the job? Why did you join this company? Okay, go back to these roots and you will be able to find that answer, okay? And then choose one of those tools or frameworks in how you operationalize it and you keep investing in it. I mean, culture in a company, uh, we're both in HR tech and this is a big topic and that's actually quite an ambiguous thing, what, what culture actually means for different people. But whatever you want to call it, it's like a plant, okay? Water it. If you water it, it will grow. If you don't water it, it ain't gonna grow, okay? It's not gonna flourish in here. So, it, and, and that, that comes from being authentic yourself and having that care. And Ashik, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna pick something that I think that you just, you just talked about, and 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 I, and it was an unlock for me, is if you're, if you, if you have, because oftentimes people say, I just can't get my team engaged. It's, it's a generational thing, or it's a like, you know, they don't, they, whatever the reason, but they're not engaging their people the way that they want. I think you just gave a recipe for how best to do that. And I just want to make sure we pull that out. And that recipe was to ask good questions around the why, getting back to the core of why this company, why this job, um, and getting in and understanding that and, and rebuilding that as the foundation for that experience there ongoing. Is that a fair yeah, characterization yeah, absolutely. of, of absolutely. your learnings? Absolutely. Life begins with gratitude. Okay. I mean, I, 14 years on, I mean, I always ask, why did I start this company? Okay. And that actually motivates me whenever, whenever I talk to somebody who has been in the company for many, many years. Okay. And, you know, they talk about, oh, after this many years, they're going to change you up and think, why did you join? Like, and bringing back that. And this, this is extremely powerful. And it can, it's something that is better done in a one on one level. Okay. In a group yes. level, it, it, it can work for different, different people in different ways. I can tell you that it doesn't work in a Zoom. Because, you know, um, but yeah, if you can build that on a uh, on a one on one level, it's super powerful for you and for the person on the other side. So, how do you? I mean, because I mean, Deputy is not a small business anymore. Like, I mean, you guys have, I, I believe, hundreds of employees. So, how do you how do you ask that why that's done individually? At a company that's got hundreds of employees, like how how do you how do you do that? Or it can't just be you. You got to make sure your managers are doing this. How are you managing that part of your growth? Now, look, I mean, it, it's definitely a challenging thing, and it's also a challenging thing being in the world of Zoom, okay, or Google Hangout, however you want to say it. This this super this actually is hard to do on the Zoom, okay, especially in a group session, okay, uh, where like you know there's about everyone about 20 different boxes in a screen only only when one person talks other people can't talk energy can very much dissipate um, in there something that i have found uh, like and i mean brad being vulnerable and honest we struggled at the beginning of covid we as a company even i as a leader myself i really struggled at the beginning of the covid but as then lockdown started lifting and thing and we could be with people together again realize that how much better we can build trust and engagement with each other okay it's not employees i don't i don't see employees as employees myself i see them like in a, every company every company is a community to some degree okay and it, all of us are the, are a community member um in there i mean I, I fundamentally believe that people don't come to work for work people come to work to be part of a community a community that is a purpose, a community where you feel have that belonging in there. And that belonging doesn't happen over Zoom, okay, that much in there, okay? So as much as, uh, I mean, I have actually heavily invested in myself to travel, as soon as, like, you could travel after COVID, travel everywhere I can where our employees are, going and meeting them face-to-face, -face, spending that one-on-one -on -one time, and... Um, from what I hear, it has energized them. And I can tell you that it has given me so much energy. I cannot wait to get out of bed every morning and 
dive doing what I'm doing in there. So my my recommendation was like, try to try to invest in. Don't 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 sit in the comfy of your, um, uh, um, a, a, you know, uh, study room or work office at home. Ironically, we're both there right now, but I will be going to the office after this, Brad. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll be going. I'll be going to uh, our office right after this, and uh, yeah, um, that will be my recommendation. Okay, as much as try doing that in one on one, then you'll find the recipe of how to do this one to many. Yeah, and just just why because you brought it up, and I'm sure people are going to be like, "Well, Brad, ask him about." What is the what are the work modes for you right now? Are you back in person in office? Are you home? Are you a mix of that across your different um, offices and geographies? Yeah, I mean we're we're a bit of a hybrid at um, um, at deputy. Like you know, I mean, uh, what we highly recommend is that the squads or the team you're part of at least once or twice a week get together. Okay, get together either for doing the work or doing the meetings or building trust. By the way, employee engagement is the biggest topic in any HR software, any HR tech uh, um, in, in today's world. Uh, let me get this right. You're not going to have engagement if you don't have trust. You may have trust, but not engagement. But if you don't have the trust, you'll never uh, have the engagement. In, in How can you be engaged um, with the business you don't trust? How can you be engaged with the leader you don't trust in there? And trust is not built. I mean, that's that's that can be a whole postcard on its own in terms of like you know, talking about trust in there. But it's 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 really uh, hard to build, maintain, nurture trust in in the in the whole uh, whole remote world. Well, probably you can, but you have to invest a lot in there. But when you are three dimensional, when you are human to human, um, we're social social beings over here. Okay. Simple hugs or handshakes can go a long way in how you build trust. Yeah, I, I, um, a lot of that resonates with me. And as, as you know, as as you think about your own your your own hiring philosophy from what you learn from COVID, and um, you know, in terms of proximity to an office where people can come together, because what I hear a lot of times right now is she because people are like. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to get together once or twice per week, but like our our team is spread out all over the world or all over a state or a country. Like, how have you guys managed your own talent philosophy through COVID to continue to enable squads like this to get together? Look, but I, we can, we're still figuring this out ourselves, okay? I don't think there is, uh, you know, uh, we have a successful formula in here, I mean, I can tell you that uh, we made a very unpopular decision by the board, but it turned out to be the best decision is, you know, as the whole world was going into this recession around April, May, uh, I was in a board meeting saying that, hey, we want to get an office. And my board is like, are you joking? Like, you know, everybody's cutting costs and you want to get a you want to get an office? And me and my CFO, we are like, nah, look, I mean, we fundamentally believe that, you know, this will be. Um, a great enabler for people's, um, uh, you know, engagement, the trust, the productivity. And we actually, you know, did get that office, even though people here in Sydney, we also have an office in San Francisco, and even the people who weren't um, um, in our, in Australia, we are quite, uh, a lot of people are in Sydney, but there's a lot of people we have in Brisbane, in Adelaide, in Melbourne, in different parts uh, uh, of the country. Um, And as soon as we opened the office, we actually did a hackathon, okay? And not just engineering product, but everything. And we actually flew the people over, and and the the level of trust, engagement, and validation it drove was electrifying. Okay, and and every day as people are coming back to the office uh, in there, I mean, uh, we actually only got the office which is half the size of what our actually employee size is uh, in here. But it's still, it's getting really, really good good usage. And um, it, if anything, it's just driving. It just gives you that boost of moral and purpose for people by by, um, by people coming into the office. I would actually recommend that um, you know even though everyone is remote, I'm pretty sure every business, if you look at it, you have some pockets of density where possible. Get those people together. Doesn't matter whether they're in one department or different departments or not. Get those people together. Um, we're human. We're designed to be social. We seek connection from each other. Why wouldn't you do that? 
Okay, and if you, if you're if you're worried about cost, trust me. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. It's a rounding error. That's a that that's a challenge to uh, to our listeners as you think about your business. Do not you you heard it here first. Don't be penny wise pound foolish. Nothing is more important than enge- and then investing in the engagement of your team. That's 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 a a good call to action. Ashik, I have a question as I was taking notes. You mentioned belonging a second ago, and that is something obviously in HR we talk a lot about is like the sense of belonging, um, inclusivity. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, that I've heard recently, there was a blog where people are, you know, saying a lot of folks are talking about it, but are we genuinely creating an area where people can belong and be that authentic um, leader or employee or you know person at at a company. What's your kind of thoughts and philosophy around kind of belonging, inclusivity, um, you know, in the workplace? From a leadership perspective, everything starts with leadership over here. From a leadership perspective, my fundamental kind of recommendation and my own kind of viewpoint into the world has been is that you, it starts with gratitude and authenticity. You're not going to have belonging if you, if, you're not, if you don't have the gratitude for being part of the place you are, okay? You as a leader and then also similarly the, the members, the team members, okay? But that starts by the leader setting the tone. Thank you. Thank you for being part. Even if you're not happy right now, I just want to start by saying thank you, okay? That the fact that you have chosen, there's no shortage of employment opportunity for anybody in this world at the moment, okay? The fact that you've chosen to be part of my organization starts with gratitude, okay? And the second thing is being authentic. You being authentic about who you are and you accepting people for who they are. You're, not, you're never going to have authentic, like, you know, belonging or inclusivity in a business where people are asked to put a mask on to be somebody else that they are not. Okay? And that comes from the fear of judgment. That comes, the fear, comes from fear of, uh, uh, um, like, you know, uh, missing out on opportunities and things. If, you, if, if there is those things are there, you will never have people being authentic. And when you're not going to have people being authentic, you're not going to have, uh, they, they just naturally won't feel belonging in there. And then you're not going to have the culture of inclusivity in there. So uh, my recommendation actually has been, uh, you know, it starts with leadership and the leadership having gratitude and authenticity. And that's actually um, what I practice myself in there. I mean, so much, so much, so often, the notion of leadership is like, you know, showing who is the boss in the room. That kind of notion just does not work, okay? You're not going to have... Maybe it would have <laughs> worked in a, in a different world, okay? Maybe it worked 50, 60 years ago. But no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 we are in a different world. And it's not those generational things and things, the millennials, the Gen Zs and things, all these other things that get thrown around or not. But hey, we're we're all people. We're all people. M- maybe we all have been brought up in different ways because of different generation. Uh, I mean, our background, where we are born, where we have grown up, what our culture and thing. If you don't take the time to understand these things, okay, you'll never be, uh, you'll never create that environment where people are people are belonging. And when they're not there, when when you don't feel like you belong, you're not just gonna do your great job. Greatest job over there. You will do what you would do, but you're not ever going to go the extra yard for the place you work at. I I, I love I love the principles that you use to frame uh, every conversation. But the conversation here on belonging and inclusivity is to start with gratitude. Like that's that's a that's a powerful principle that you don't often hear to where 
you know, no matter you know, no matter how you feel about this or that, but you're not going to be able to achieve that belonging or inclusivity unless you start from a place of gratitude. Like that's a power kind of really powerful principle. And then the authenticity, it's like be true to who you are and who they are, but you know, but do it through that lens of gratitude and trust. So I think really powerful, you know, kind of principle there. So let's maybe take uh, a couple a couple minutes. And let's talk about the future of, you know, of, of HR, HR tech, you know, workplaces. Um, what do you see as, you know, are things or trends or gotchas that are on the horizon for us as an industry, for business owners that we should be, we should be thinking about? I used to talk a lot about this three years ago, Brad. <laughs> But I can guarantee you the world of remote work and how things are changing wasn't on the menu back then, okay? That has completely changed because of COVID. So um, it's, uh, you know, that one Grisky quote, and I want to get where the puck will be as opposed to where the puck is. So, like, you know, a lot of things are changing. I mean, the, okay, depending on your audience, okay, like, you know, whether they're employers of knowledge workers, like you and I are, or whether the employers of shift workers, okay, non-knowledge workers, non-desk workers, like maybe uh, our customers are many, or common customers, I mean, most of my customers and deputy are uh, employers of shift workers. Um, the, the, there's two answers to these questions, okay, and you need to think very differently um, in terms of who you are, uh, because I don't think one advice applies to the other in there. Now, when it comes to... Um, the knowledge workers, okay, people are, people want to do a great job, okay, and people actually want to grow. Now, growth comes in two forms, okay, either there's career growth or personal growth. There's a lot of talk about career growth, okay, even in, like, in my own company, we just went through a uh, uh, a PNC or cycle over here, like, you know, where there's a whole lot of talk about, you know, how someone's career or other thing is growing. I see a lot of companies spending a lot of time on that one, but not a lot of companies spending much time or anything like that on the personal growth side, okay? How do we grow the people personally? And as I said at the very beginning, I mean, the, the whole notion of gratitude and, like, you know, why did you uh, join this job? Why did you join this company or why did we hire you you know, uh, going from there and how do we want to grow you? Okay, what does life look like? What What are your hopes and dreams? And and quite a lot of those hopes and dreams actually, uh, I mean, candidates don't talk about it. And even when I talk to the people over here, uh, in even my own company, sometimes they actually don't have that clarity. But helping them craft that narrative in there about the personal growth is something that's super important for all organizations. And then, doesn't matter whether you're hybrid, remote, uh, or like, you know, um, uh, nine to five every day in the office, all of those things will resolve itself, okay? You just need to pick the right strategies in terms of how you go solve that. But keep that in mind, okay? That's, that's why advice have been for the knowledge uh, worker world. When it comes to the non-knowledge worker, okay, the hourly worker, the shift workers uh, that deputy is so focused on, okay, we have a massive battle in our hand at the moment, okay? And I am... I am on a crusade to right this wrong that has happened over the last few years. Brad, I presume you have taken lots of Uber rides. Next time you're on Uber, ask the Uber driver, what do you like about Uber? What do you think they will answer? Or if you have asked this question, what do you think they, they answer? I think they'd probably say flexibility. Bingo. That's the answer. I have taken over 1,900 Uber rides that I've asked in every Uber ride. What is it? It's that. If I ask, so what's the second best thing about Uber? What do you think they answer? Um, as I've asked similar questions, and I don't, this is, this is more infrequent would be, I like to meet people, <laughs> to connect with people. Yep, that has that that has come up. That has come up. Like you know, I like the music. I like this, that. I don't even all sorts of different things. But 
actually, in many cases, there's actually no answer at all. Okay, people have to dig to find something in there. But that's the truth in there. And, and what, what is ending, ending up happening over here, a lot of people have gone for all these you know, gig work over here uh, where they're prioritizing flexibility, but they're missing. I mean, I ask, hey, do you think you're growing as a person? They're like, no. Is there somebody who is vested in your growth? No. Do you like the pay? Meh. Like, you know, there's all sorts of different things. So what's happening in the whole world of hourly paid workforce at the moment is a lot of people are going and choosing all this gig work as opposed to actually belonging in a community, okay, belonging in a company where they can grow. They can add to the purpose of the company and they can add to um, their own growth. And the reason they don't have that flexibility in the business they're in is because of bad scheduling practice. Sorry for the shameless plug, because that's the thing that deputy can solve, okay? You don't have to. I mean, scheduling is to be a zero-sum game of control, where if the manager had all the control, employees had no control. If employees had control, manager had no control. But in deputy, you can actually get the best of both worlds, where you can set up your shifts, set up as open, open shift, and people can come and claim the shift they want. So they get the flexibility of life, along with the business solving the problem of I need someone who's going to actually do the job in there. And you do get to be part of the community and you do get to have a manager and you do get to grow um, in there. And, you know, because businesses that haven't been on deputy and they've been like, you know, doing rostering in uh, Excel or pen and paper, some use some um, uh, antiquated uh, 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 enterprise software. They claim to themselves to be AI powered, which is not this is just all bullshit marketing, <laughs> and, but it just gives people their uh, scheduling when they, um, uh, without any kind of care for the needs and wants of the employees. That's where I see businesses actually are going backwards and we're doing a massive disservice to the society and economy. So I'm on a crusade to right this wrong. I like it. I like the passion, and but I do like the connection to where like – we we have created some of these environments that are separating our, our ourselves from each other. And I like this notion of the business as the community and, and then the investment in those relationship helps not only your career growth, but your personal growth and helps round that out. So I think it's a, a great crusade to be on. But Ashik, we're 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 out of time. I I, I want to just express my gratitude for you to come on and share some of those hard won lessons. The thing about life is those lessons that we pay the price to learn are the gems and the insights that we can give to others. And so I appreciate you bringing your experience, sharing that with the audience um, as you've um, as you've covered a lot of ground in your career. So uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Brad. It was fun, like, you know, uh, sparring with you about all, all these things. We're, we're, we're both aligned in our, uh, you know, passion and mission of how we can set businesses, our customers, up for success by making their people successful. So thank you for doing what you do and having me as well. Thank you, Ashik. And, and for the listeners, thank you again for tuning into this episode of The Era. Um, please tune in next time as we continue this dialogue around employee experience and driving to better business outcomes for you, your, uh, your business, and your people. Thank you very much.